So a very good evening to everyone. Uh, we're just waiting for a couple of minutes to uh, see if uh, the few other few of others who might be joining in. So we'll get started in exactly two minutes. Thank you. All right, uh, very good evening, everyone. Um, Namaskar, and uh, this is the first of our fall uh, semester Samvad sessions uh, scheduled uh, today. And it is an honor and a privilege uh, to have amongst us uh, one of the most, I would say, probably revered and celebrated development economists, uh, someone who has been a teacher and a mentor to. To, to at least a few of us, and um, we've looked forward to to hosting uh, him for for some for some time now. And probably there couldn't have been a better occasion to have a more uh, distinguished uh, person discussing uh, the different facets about the the more precarious nature of the of India's economic uh, position and situation at this point of time. Um, before we begin, uh, just a couple of points on, on how we, we structure uh, the Samwar discussion. Uh, most of these discussions are framed largely as a question and answer uh, deliberation. So there are a few pointed questions that are raised and asked um, with uh, Professor uh, Matrij Ghatak today. Um, and we'll be discussing on different aspects around the Indian economy, not only pertaining to what the macroeconomic situation looks like now, or let's say um, in, in the months ahead. In fact, it's very difficult to be able to speculate or guess on how the on India's, or I would probably say almost any nation's economic trajectory would look like six months or one year from now. All what we can say is perhaps, this is perhaps one of the uh, worst or most widespread economic shocks that has been seen um, right from probably the times of the Great Depression um, and the impact and the severity of this crisis uh, may have ramifications for a lot of emerging and developing nations. Um, with the, just to, uh, uh, as I was saying, just to give you a little bit of perspective on how uh, we would be planning our discussion today, um, I would be asking for the first uh, uh, 40 to 45 minutes, a series of questions uh, with Professor uh, Maitreish to, to get the discussion going. And we'll then open up the, the conversation to, to the audience. Uh, most of you, uh, can can enter or type in your questions in the chat box um, at the time when you have uh, any. You don't need to wait uh, for, for the discussion to probably reach at a certain stage or time. If you have any burning questions or any pointed queries, you could probably put those across and I'll relay those across uh, to Professor. Um, just to before we, we officially begin our uh, conversation, uh, this brief introduction uh, of uh, Professor Maitreish Ghatak. Um, uh, Professor Maitreish Ghatak is Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics and a Fellow of the British Academy. Uh, he's co-editor of Economica, uh, having formerly served as the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Development Economics, uh, Managing Editor of the Review of Economic Studies, um, and co-editor of the Economics of Transition. Um, trust me, as, as, as someone who has been uh, trained in the discipline of economics, these are journals which uh, take a lot of time to be able to get a chance to even 
uh, go past through those walls and walls of peer reviewed stages. Um, he's, he's the director of the Development Economics Research Program at the Santori Toyota International Center for Economics and Related Disciplines, famously called as TISERD. Uh, he famously, uh, previously taught at uh, the University of Chicago and is a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research and is a member of the board of directors as well as senior fellow of the Bureau uh, for Research in Economic Analysis and Development, uh, abbreviated as BRED. His work focuses mainly on issues in development economics, public economics, and economics of organizations. Uh, he was educated uh, earlier at Presidency College, Calcutta, um, uh, the Delhi School of Economics, and Harvard University, where he did his doctoral degree. So with that, uh, we warmly welcome you, um, uh, Professor Matrish, and uh, it has been uh, quite uh, honestly an, an honor for all of us to, to get a chance, and particularly students at this uh, stage and level to get a chance to hear you. Um, I would probably uh, get the conversation going because we have a, a shorter window of time uh, to be able to dive right into the conversation. And for that, probably let me just, uh, before I take off the slides from the presentation, uh, sharing screen, I think just the three focal points of our conversation today. Um, the first one, which is uh, going to look at largely in understanding the current economic scenario and position. Uh, the second part of our conversation would delve largely on looking at what kind of reforms do we actually need. There is often uh, a lot of discussion on reforms. And in fact, probably there is a, there's, there's a sort of uh, reform inflation um, in, in discourse, particularly around on what kind of reforms one needs and, and, and at what point of time. Um, but uh, the, the, the nature of our uh, economic situation at this point of time, what kind of uh, responses can the state or even other uh, actors like the private sector can undertake to uh, look at addressing these challenges would be uh, something to look at. The third aspect would look at largely the political economy um, uh, conditions of, of India's weekly growth trajectory. As most of you would know, India was already in a very um, uh, deep state of trouble, if I would probably say, as we got into the pandemic. In fact, uh, some might argue that the pandemic has overshadowed a lot of the discussion that was happening earlier uh, in the quarters before on the precarity of the, of the demand side slowdown we were seeing. So it would be interesting to look at what are some of the political uh, economy uh, ramifications or conditions that have uh, exacerbated the current challenges. Um, all right, so with that, let me just probably shop uh, sharing the screen. Okay, and uh, all right, so we have some right here. So, uh, sir, before we get started, any opening remarks that, that you'd probably want to give in and to dive right into? No, thank you very much. Uh, can I be heard? Yes, it'd have to okay, be a little good. louder. That's it. Okay, let me try to uh, do that. Uh, adjust the volume a little bit. Okay, uh, hopefully this is a bit better. Um, so, no, thank you, Dipankshu, for inviting me to this particular series that uh, you're running and with a very uh, distinguished um, uh, series of speakers. Uh, very happy to be part of it. And also, I you know, always welcome opportunities to have direct conversations with Indian students, you know, who are thinking, struggling through all that is happening, that even to some of us old folks or, well, not so young anymore folks, uh, seems baffling. So therefore, it's always a good opportunity to have a genuine back and forth in terms of what, uh, you know, uh, we think versus what, uh, what uh, some of the more younger uh, minds are thinking in terms of how they're making sense of all that is happening around us. And also I have to um, uh, praise um, um, Deepang Shumohan for um, preparing a set of very thoughtful questions. In fact, he, you know, when, when I first agreed to do that, I, it wasn't clear how this was going to go. But I must praise him that to see that somebody who has read my pieces uh, very carefully and then ask questions which are both interesting and, and of not really 
that easy to answer. Uh, that really uh, also makes me uh, quite, quite enthusiastic about this session. I haven't prepared any structured discussion, so to keep the spirit of a conversation going, uh, but absolutely I think the core, um, uh, I think purpose here will be, I will outline my broad vision for each of these questions without necessarily getting into too much of the nitty gritty, but very happy to come back to them as and when uh, clarification is needed. Thank you. Again. Great. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we get started with the first part of the conversation that is going to look at largely inter at interpreting the current economic scenario. So the first question um, that, that we had, and I would like to also thank uh, uh, Shijit, uh, Adam, Advaita, Stehal, and the entire team of uh, buzzing columnists for, for a fascinating set of questions they have shared. Some of them are overlapping with the ones that we had uh, pre-identified. So I'm going to um, kind of squeeze uh, the conversation in, in, in keeping the structure aligned. The first question is, um, at a time when the geoeconomic landscape is facing its biggest and most widespread economic shock since the Great Depression, uh, can you give us an insight on how bad the growth situation looks for the Indian economy both now and let's say in terms of uh, what the near uh, or medium term future looks like. More importantly, what are the key factors in your understanding that have exacerbated India's weak uh, macroeconomic position from the time even before the pandemic? Sure. I think that um, as we know that even much before this crisis hit, there are some very legitimate controversies about the measurement of our GDP, what exactly are the growth rates capturing, and even if you take a very non-partisan and kind of somewhat technocratic view of the system, uh, it is well accepted that a good part of our GDP estimation and growth, therefore growth rate estimates Mission is basically guesswork vis a vis the importance of the informal sector, where, you know, um, you know certainly by conservative estimates, 80 85 percent of our workers are in. Uh, by, um, by some other estimates, it's higher, and at least half the output comes from there. So, therefore, there is always a little bit of a uh, you know, even in the best of times, uh, there is a certain structural problem uh, as, uh, based on estimating our national income. And of course, when a crisis happens, um, then that is, um, uh, you know, these kind of systems um, uh, become in some ways the range of error uh, uh, goes up, right? So with that caveat, let's try to look at what some of the estimates that are being um, uh, talked about. So first of all, a number of multilateral uh, international organizations such as the IMF or the World Bank are giving out some kind of international comparisons, etc. And not to bore you with too much of the, uh, you know, uh, this percent and that percent kind of talk, uh, I would say IMF's projection is India's growth rate in 2021 is going to be minus 5%. And if we want to put that in perspective, this is essentially uh, uh, higher uh, compared to some other East Asian uh, emerging economies, um, you know, uh, that includes China, but not just China, Indonesia, Vietnam, etc. And it's, however, the extent of the loss is lower than some Latin American countries and, and South Africa, etc. Again, kind of sticking to a band of somewhat comparable countries. Now, like I, the entire preface about, you know, what does the minus 5% mean? Does it mean that if we originally were, you know, um, uh, 100, then now it's going to be 95? by all accounts, it's going to be far less because if you have sheer stoppage of economic activity over a certain period, right, uh, whatever the formal informal sector measurement issues, whatever method you use, clearly the damage is more, right? I mean, and, and, and I think therefore, uh, indeed, I read uh, somewhere in the news that the RBI may not publish the 21-22 growth mm -hmm. figures because, again, because of the you know, a, uh, it's always a little bit, um, you know, it's one of those uh, classic paradoxical statements that when you say five, minus 5% 5 growth, uh, 
that seems a bit Orwellian, right? So you want to say a 5% contraction of the economy maybe would be more appropriate, but you know, minus 5% growth uh, always seems, you know, uh, a little bit um, maybe euphemistically, you know, uh, you know, I suppose I'm trying to lose, uh, lose weight. So if I say I have a, a minus 10%, you know, um, uh, loss of weight, which means I've actually gained weight by 10%, that, uh, that, that is, uh, but leaving that, um, that kind of semantic issue aside. So I think we, this is not good, right? Now, how bad it is, I, I'm not uh, uh, sufficiently uh, uh, in the you know nitty gritty of the national income estimates, and it is better for those experts give us a range of what could be the you know a negative interval over which we should be looking at. So now let's think about going back to the Pankshu's initial question. So that's the kind of immediate prognosis and our prospects. A lot of these calculations, whether these are uh, IMF World Bank or whether these are various private banks or other institutions that are then saying what is going to be the recovery like, you know, we are hearing about various, you know, letters of the alphabet like the V and the J and whatever, you know, uh, tumbling L. Uh, and I think that again, a lot of these are essentially using some kind of a mechanical catch up type of you know thing estimating that if this is going to be a turnaround say starting december or whatever starting next uh, next spring and then you're estimating based on what was the trend growth before even here i think in the case of india we should be careful in using any kind of linear extrapolation because of the phenomenon that was described earlier in, in, in the Pankshu's opening question, which is there was a trend decrease in the growth rate. If you really started from, you know, uh, starting even 2013, 14, 2014, 15, there has been a secular downward trend in the growth rate right before this kind of perfect storm of the public health crisis and the attendant economic crisis induced by public health as well as the lockdown aspect of things. So therefore, it is, I, I'm not really kind of that optimistic as to whether we're going to have a almost, you know, uh, not too painful 5% uh, rate of contraction to be followed by a V-shaped recovery. If it, that happens, none of us uh, will be, you know, we'll, all of us will be delighted because it's not just a matter of, you know, growth rates. It's a matter of livelihoods for, you know, uh, literally millions of, of, of Indians and across the world. And therefore, uh, we do hope that the most pessimistic projections do not play out. But yes, I would say this was the starting situation where the growth rate was decreasing. And then we have been hit by the shock that led to the lockdown and also voluntary withdrawal from activity. This has led to the classic kind of Keynesian multiplier type things where you have a contraction of supply that leads to contraction in income, that leads to contraction in demand. And therefore you can see like a wave, it is the first wave, then you have the follow, following waves. So therefore all this has caused economic activity to be you know, uh, severely uh, go down. And that's where we are right now. I'll, I'll pause here uh, for any clarification or Just nudging if I did not answer any part of the original no, question. So just one quick follow up on that, sir, uh, would be mostly to understand how unique is this COVID uh, shock vis-a-vis uh, -vis the kind of uh, shocks we are generally more accustomed to seeing, because given the fact that this was operating in an economy which was facing a you know, deep aggregate demand uh, side slowdown already, uh, you had a situation where a lot of the states were interconnected with the distribution of goods that, that takes place um, and the supply uh, side uh, shock uh, because of the lockdown uh, caused a lot of uh, you know, disruptions in even supply of essentials. So what we are seeing right now is a very uh, peculiar kind of, uh, uh, you know, a, a set of uh, chain reactions that are very difficult to understand unless you look at the comic geography of a given particular uh, space. So what I'm trying to understand is maybe this is the first time where even for a macro exercise of, of, of aggregate uh, numbers to be extrapolated, you need to have a very good micro intuitive 
um, understanding of what's happening. Uh, so how do we make sense of this, particularly from, from a disciplinary perspective? No, I think that's a very, um, you know, um, fair and nuanced question. So it's not just having kind of uh, aggregate economy captured by say income, why, and then employment, you know, and then yeah. you have, of course, it's a negative shock and that it spills over to demand uh, shocks and, and successive chains of it exactly as in multiplied analysis. I think that, look, there are several degrees of or several dimensions of heterogeneity that are important here. So the first in the case of um, India that is particularly relevant once again is the formal informal sector, you know? And why do I emphasize it? There are several reasons, but let me just flag the key ones. You see, one of the things that I think this crisis has made very clear is what maybe macroeconomists or, you know, especially, you know, um, uh, know very well about, but maybe in the public domain, there's not that much clarity of understanding, is the difference between stocks and flows. Mm -hmm. So in particular, you know, uh, those who have not been hit that badly by this or are surviving all right, is because they had an existing stock, whether it's, ex you know, existing savings, you know, uh, or, 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 or assets they could sell off or, or, or rent out to essentially generate income, or having an organized sector good job, which less than 3% of the population has, um, uh, where essentially the fact that you have the promise of a monthly salary coming in, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, that itself is like an asset uh, that is bearing returns. It's like you have a you know, certain equity on your human capital uh, guaranteed by certain legal and contractual um, uh, um, structures. Yeah? But if 97% of the population is without this, and even within this 3%, not everybody has a guaranteed job. So there are layoffs in the private sector, even among the you know, uh, relatively well-to-do folks. So I think the first degree of heterogeneity we have to keep in mind is that for the overwhelming large fraction of the economy, right? essentially complete quarantine was never an option. In, it, it, because otherwise you just, you know, you're going to, you know, sit and starve and die. Again, I'm not saying anything that, you know, anybody at this stage doesn't know or, or would have guessed right away. So I think, therefore, this creates the broad, you know, uh, tension that essentially that in the informal sector, which where most people are, there are some low key degree of activity is going on because it's almost like otherwise, you know, there is no way uh, people are going to even um, be able to have uh, a minimum number of meals a day. So that's the first degree of heterogeneity we need to keep in mind between informal and informal. And also relatedly, this comes from the stock point, that also means that one of the interesting things is as the relatively protected minority, you know, economically sheltered minority, because of the restrictions on consumption possibilities, they're going to essentially, their savings have gone up, their effective savings debt have gone up. Whereas for the rest of the population that doesn't have this guarantee or they do not have stocks to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, decumulate, essentially they are going to get into debt as much as uh, what the lower level of economic activity to the extent they cannot make ends meet, they're going to go into debt. So therefore we will have a rising inequality because of this reason that the relatively affluent sections are going to be not only well protected, their savings might even go up because of the restricted consumption possibilities, while for the vast majority of the population, it's going to go in the other direction. And these will have macro implication. Mm -hmm. You know, as we know from macro, the, the expression built in depressor, if a, if a whole a fraction of the population essentially is indebted. So even when the economy turns around, they will be under pressure to pay off their existing debts, et cetera, before they can actually go back to their normal economic activity that then will generate demand and supply the virtuous cycles of that. So I think therefore the informal formal sector distinction and the you know, big income inequality that um, has always been part of assets as well as income inequality are going to be important determinants of it. And the third, and you know, one could go on, but I, I uh, you know, I want, uh, I want us uh, to, um, you know, have have a have a back and forth here. The third aspect is you you can also see that 
in terms of urban areas, a lot of our economic activities interact, involves interactions, whether it's in the process of getting to work, uh, getting to set up your, open your uh, shop, you know, as well as the service uh, activities, they all involve more face-to-face -face or human interactions. In fact, some would say, from an abstract point of view, what are cities except for big human clusters, right? I mean, that's just a, you know more more um, um, kind of you know people-centered notion of a city compared to the rural areas. So initially, when you referred to the piece that I wrote in March, uh, I was under the optimistic expectation that at that time, because of this, maybe, and also the fact that uh, this uh, uh, disease is uh, going to be carried by international passengers, people, you know, uh, from coming from abroad, maybe it will be restricted to urban areas and it will not spread to the rural areas where two thirds of the population lives. But we know how the whole migrant workers, um, you know, situation played out. That because wow. of the inadequate planning and 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 kind of um, uh, the induced kind of ejection aspect of what happened to that big segment of the Indian labor force, they then went back to the rural areas, and that's where some of the spikes have happened. So I would say yeah. these are the uh, kind of uh, parameters to keep in mind in terms of getting beyond a very aggregative kind of supply yeah. demand uh, shock kind of framework. That's so. That's interesting. Uh, so, and there are two. Uh, just to before we move on to the, the next question uh, points that were coming out, and it's emerging out very clearly from the data now. Uh, on the point that you made about effective savings going up, that a lot of people, particularly in the semi-urban rural uh, belt, are now preferring to store a lot of money in our, or probably borrow a lot of money based on gold. And the prices of gold and silver both are picking up as a result of the banks having it uh, difficult. Now it seems that there's some tension between commercial banks uh, who did have some kind of uh, base of giving gold loans and the RBI um, issue that that you should probably give loans up to 90 percent of of the value and banks are skeptical that if tomorrow there's some kind of a price shock uh, this may have a, a, you know a, a kind of a double whammy shock on 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 them and uh, the distinction between formal and informal i think that's that's as pertinent as ever and probably i'll come back to that again because that's a major policy question that that i think grapples most of us at all points of time uh, given what works, what doesn't, in what context. Um, the second question, which is uh, kind of drawn in from a, from a piece that you'd written uh, earlier, and uh, this is the one that you were referring to uh, just a while back, where you said, and I quote, uh, there simply isn't, isn't enough uh, capacity in the state uh, sector or the organized private sector to manage the supply chain at a time of emergency like this. Uh, this immediately implies that law enforcement officers must take a much more tolerant approach to enforcing the lockdown. They should not blindly force everyone who ventures out to sell or buy uh, to go home. Uh, now, this is something which you've mentioned already that, that probably the imposition of a harsh curfew style lockdown didn't make much sense in our um, economic topography so as to speak, which has this, these deep heterogeneities in place or fragmentations in place. But what in your understanding uh, could have been done to reduce this, the, the catastrophic economic cost and perhaps even the, the, the psychological trauma that, that has been caused to millions of workers um, and the images that all that we saw reminding us almost of the partition and, and the, those uh, you know, uh, millions of workers walking on the street. Um, and what probably you think that the government could have done slightly uh, in a more, I would say, coordinated manner in responding to this. This is a question which is also raised um, in different words by Ashu, Jain and Tejaswini. So I'm kind of collating them and putting them across. Yeah, no, I think that first of all, I think it should be pointed out that any government who is faced with this kind of an unprecedented crisis, right? I mean, now we are digging up all the historical incidents of pandemics and, and, and so on. But certainly it, this was a, a relatively one of those black swan events that none of us expected our lives, all of our lives to go so much topsy-turvy. And therefore I would say any government is allowed some period of kind of really trying to figure things out. So therefore, 
in whatever criticism one has to level, I should, you know, I think all of us should try to put ourselves in the uh, in the shoes of the policymakers and 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 try to see, given the information available at that time, could something be done different? So I think that's only fair. That's true of any government that we could be discussing, not just the case of India. So that's first thing. The second thing is, I think there are all kinds of sometimes pointless ideological debates that crop up every time there is a crisis like this. And one of the most, I think, futile ideological debates that have, has come up uh, um, is essentially that, hey, you know, uh, should the government have been doing anything or, you know, this, this kind of, you know, whether people should be, uh, other than some broad guidelines, you know, uh, left to their own devices versus whether there should have been a complete or even tougher approach and so on. So I think that if you think about from the point of view of economics as well as say public health, there's no doubt that there's a huge externality involved in an epidemic. And again, I'm not saying anything that, uh, uh, that an economist or for that matter, anybody who's thinking about this would not figure out. And therefore, the case for government restrictions and controls are also there. So it's not like you can leave people to their own devices and expect somehow things to pan out, right? Now, anytime when you're putting up these caveats, I think in the you know, typical uh, models of narrative, you know a criticism is coming. So mm -hmm. the first point was, yes, every government has limited kind of foresight and especially in an unprecedented event. Number two, of course, uh, certain coercive measures had to be taken because it's not like, you know, left to their own devices, this would kind of, you know, take, uh, uh, sort itself out. The wisdom of the crowds or whatever, you know, metaphor that you want to use, which usually are used to justify against government intervention. Now, having said that, where did I think India's intervention go wrong? Now, look, there are other governments that have used pretty draconian measures too. And, you know, uh, China is a leading example. Uh, although in the case of China, with some initial bungling that led to uh, initial kind of, you know, um, uh, death rates and, 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 you know, whatever the accuracy of those death figures. Uh, but after that, uh, the Chinese state kind of, you know, got into a mode that it is uh, only very comfortable with, which is, you know, heavy handed uh, restrictions and regulations. And again, there's always some ambiguity as to how one interprets uh, whether any income numbers that come out of there or, or public health figures. But it does seem that the initial storm was weathered. So initially, the three countries that were looking the most alarming in some ways uh, were, um, um, you know, uh, China, Italy and, 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 uh, and, and Spain. And over the uh, last few months, this picture has clearly you know, changed. And uh, initially, UK and US also to some, you know, they continue to be. And of course, Brazil, Mexico, South Africa, you know, are some of the countries that are not in good shape. And India, I mean, for a long period, we expected India's thing to be not hitting uh, the kind of scary uh, heights it could be hitting. And we were kind of thinking for a number of reasons, uh, maybe uh, whether it has to do with climate or, 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 or some adaptation from other diseases and so on. So I would say that where India fell short was essentially it in a way combined a heavy handed state intervention, which, you know, involved this, you know, whatever, a uh, couple of hours notice lockdown. Yeah. So that is very high on the draconian or, or kind of, you know, uh, um, uh, point of view. But then the actual enforcement of it, as well as the unintended and unplanned consequences, now it seems is very clear that essentially undid any potential gains from it's a bit like okay a tough surgery was needed but you know if it was done right maybe with some you know uh, costs the patient would have come out all right but here there was an element of botching here that because of the you know uh, uh, not planning the transportation not planning also the fact that you know it's one thing to think about if you are in the security of your middle class or 
up home that, okay, we're going to have to uh, bear out this uh, shock while this, it rages outside. You're not thinking about the slum areas where migrant workers and non-migrant workers live, where social or physical distancing, uh, you know, has, has really no very little effective meaning. And not just that, it is difficult to tell somebody, you know, uh, that, hey, you cannot do all of these things without having some protective uh, 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 net, safety net around. So to come back to, uh, so let me try to put this uh, point in a, you know, as pithy a way as I can. So subject to the initial caveats, I said that the problem was not easy. Therefore, whatever government, uh, you know, there would be some degree of trial and error. And I think that would be only fair. And, and the fact that, you know, this is something that uh, has uh, affected and some degree of course, the measures were and continue to be needed. I think there were really two problems. One is, as economists, we know, you know, you cannot only have sticks, you need carrots. For any time the government needs to give incentives for people to behave in a way which they may not behave in, you know, in the socially desirable way, uh, only a coercive state uses punishments or sticks only. You know, you need some kind of carrots and sticks, right? So that is where I think the fact that not only our uh, welfare safety net is rudimentary, even in some of the economic packages that were announced, mm. even by the standards of other developing countries, not by the standards of advanced European you know, welfare states, the re support was relatively meager. So it creates the first level of problem that you know, it, it, these are complementary. You know, these kind of severe lockdown would be much more effective and credible if you also had you know, uh, a greater uh, um, uh, rolling out of a certain protective layer so that people could see that, look, uh, there is, uh, you know, it is tough, but yes, we can bear it because there are also some measures. Again, I'm not saying nothing was done. I mean, the PDS entitlement increase, the Narega increase, these are among the more positive measures and, and also some of the direct transfers of cash, et cetera. And I'm leaving aside the implementation problems with those for now. Uh, so it was not like nothing was done, but it was too little and, and, and not, not. So that's the first problem, that it was all more dictate and, and kind of coercive uh, things about you cannot do this. If you go out, the police could harass you, beat you up, right? That kind of things that we saw in the early part of the lockdown stories, right? That there were all sorts of stories about the um, law enforcement acting in a fairly uh, coercive way about people who are really desperate as opposed to people who are being uh, callous or, or reckless. Number two, I would say the first point therefore is that we needed also a little bit of the carrot to go with the stick uh, to, to make this whole um, uh, um, intervention kind of work. Number two is the botching of even the carrot as well as the stick part. So in, in some ways you could argue China did the carrot and the stick part after their initial fumbling and trying to uh, kind of put it under the carpet and I don't know, maybe hoping it will go away. Once it took on board what was going on, uh, they were better able to do this. And of course, countries like Vietnam and South Korea and Taiwan have done a great job. And, and, and I, I think that's where I would say that uh, our lack of the carrot bit, you know, uh, as well as the fact that a lot of the implementation, and again, I, it, it's not a very abstract point. The whole migrant worker debacle is an example of inadequate planning and the implementation problem. So it is like you, you, you are trying to have an iron fist, but then the things are slipping from your finger because oh. you, you, you know, sometimes when you're you know, uh, sometimes just direct force or direct uh, diktat is not the best way to achieve it. So mm -hmm. certain transportation planning, the same Atta Nirbhar, uh, um, um, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, the, the, I, I, I think the, I, I use the wrong, wrong, wrong phrase here. I mean, Atta Nirbhar has been used in other contexts, mm -hmm. but the, um, and the flights that the special flights that have been arranged uh, that would take people from abroad to, uh, to, to their homes, Immediately buses and train services should have been uh, planned uh, and, and so that uh, this, this whole uh, uh, debacle and, and truly human, um, you know, truly uh, shocking human tragedy of people having to uh, walk to their villages uh, many, many hundred miles away, that could have been avoided both for the immediate hardship, but also because they could be and they seem to be spikes in infection once they reach back. 
So, yeah, I mean, just, just to kind of take that stretch of uh, strain of thought forward, because you wrote uh, about this in a recent uh, column for NDTV, I guess, and that was where you were trying to compare what the, I mean, the directionality of response uh, between the British government and the Indian government. There's, there's, not, uh, there's not much of comparison to be made in terms of fiscal capacity per se, but in terms of what directions in which the government was seemed far more sensitive in, in the British context to what kind of problems this unique uh, you know, set of shocks have caused. So I, I quote from, from, from the column, and it's, it's a longer quote, but just for our listeners, it might be valuable. Uh, you write, and I quote, India's recovery package looks starkly different from many developed and developing countries that have recognized this as a jobs crisis and devoted the bulk of their spending to supporting jobs. The government allocated 400 million rupees in mid-May to the National Rural Employment Guarantee Program, which provides 100 days of work in rural households that need work. And news reports, of course, indicate that the program is already seeing an increase in enrollment. Part of the spending on consumption and infrastructure is dedicated to agricultural work and is likely to support jobs and growth in the future. But the share of funding devoted to preventing job losses is minuscule. The Indian government is estimated to have spent over 4% of GDP to counter the economic decline uh, from the great financial crisis in the last decade. So you go back to the 2007 and 8 shock. The budget allocation to promote job growth appears even more meager in this particular scenario as we stare at a crisis that is much more serious. So you've written about this and I mean, my, my, my follow-up question to that would be, and this is also a question that Sara and GB raise is where and what and how do you think, I mean, can the government basically boost this, this uh, slowdown in consumption demand, which was again a problem that we were facing already. My personal understanding is that there has been no acknowledgement that we're facing a crisis where there is a demand side problem because most of the responses were trying to increase liquidity measures. The RBI has gone out on the full stretch that it did. And the other concern, which has been of, of the kind of job losses we are seeing, um, to give you a con context, an example, I mean, I think we can speak from, from the case of the university environment, which is the far more stable, um, you know, base, because education, unlike other areas of service sector, um, have, has been relatively more resilient. But even there, the contractual uh, positions or the ad hoc contracts of a number of people who were either teaching or offering an, uh, allied services or activities have seen uh, layoffs. Uh, and to the extent that it is in a situation that uh, there's very little chance that most of these people may be able to get back um, into the employment force. So how do you think that, that the government at this point of time can offer those carrots to increase demand and also, because you've talked about direct transfers in a number of times, You've also spoken about the idea of universal basic income being a very important um, idea. I mean, in fact, uh, in part of the lot of debate that, that you participated in. So uh, how do you think that at this uh, point of time, uh, can there be some reforms looking at that uh, aspect? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think that just first, let me kind of clarify, which was um, implicit in your question. I think in this essay uh, that I did with my LSE colleague um, uh, Swati Dhingra, uh, we were obviously not naive to somehow think what Britain was doing, India could be doing. I mean, so first there's fiscal capacity, state capacity, and not just that, I think just basic, suppose the fiscal and state capacity was the same. Yeah. But as we know from uh, microeconomics, you know, those have more income, their consumption basket changes. So similarly, governments that have more resources, we would expect something that, you know, I informally call a policy angle curve. So, mm -hmm. which is a way to say that, look, what a government that is relatively poor can afford with the same state capacity, a government that has, I don't know, at least um, uh, 10 times the per capita income uh, would be able to do something else. So therefore, you know, as, 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 uh, as uh, whatever, um, um, you know, licensed to practice economics uh, professionals, we were aware of the fact that these were not uh, direct comparisons. And of course, 
you know, it's not the state capacity itself is different. So what we did was really more like this was the thought experiment, what we were trying to do there. And that led to the essay. See, this is a common shock. Very rarely we have a shock that's globally common, yeah. right? So this is almost like uh, some kind of, uh, you know, um, a natural experiment seeking empirical economists uh, kind of dream that, hey, we have kind of the same type of wave affecting all economies if we try to use the analogy of islands you know uh, as countries and this is a kind of similar wave hitting everybody again we understand that depending on your external exposure whether it's through migration or through trade uh, the degree to which you will be subjected to it is different right but that was the more uh, kind of really the spirit of the query that what is the developed world doing what is the emerging and developing world doing and can we learn something by the both the scale of the response as you know expenditure and other things as part of the government's you know uh, budget or a fraction of gdp as well as the composition of the policy elements so that's where we were coming from so in most of this discussion i think if you if you uh, you have read the article i i i, I know from your questions uh, is that see india's meager fiscal response is meager with respect to other emerging and developing countries. You know, we actually give specific numbers that essentially, if you uh, calculate the direct over the line uh, increase in fiscal expenditure or tax concessions, which are all over the line, by that I mean is different from the loan guarantees and uh, those kind of things or things that RBI would do, leaving that aside. So there, countries like Vietnam, Indonesia, which are comparable, right, and certainly China, they all spend, and even Brazil, which is not looking so great in terms of the public health aspect of it, as well as the economic hit they have taken, they have done a lot more compared to India. And they would be facing the typical argument you hear is, oh, come on, UK faces, you know, rating agencies, which are much more kind of relaxed about it, whereas in India, no, the rating agencies themselves are saying that, hey, you know, somehow steady the ship. And that is the key thing here. So therefore, I think it is a fair statement if you just look at cross-country comparisons, that India's response was not bold. The same boldness was that was shown in a sudden announcement of the lockdown without very little kind of uh, uh, notice it was not shown in terms of when it the time came to actually cough up uh, costly resources. So that's kind of point number one. Point number two is the composition. So I think that you're exactly right that see this crisis is a twin supply and demand crisis, right? I mean it's primarily a supply crisis because what is the first uh, way in which it shows up in our lives that we cannot go to work in an unrestricted way, right? And that is true of those of us who have more uh, steady jobs and 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 things that um, uh, you know we, we we are not under maybe a direct compulsion to go out. But even here, as you pointed out about some of the university, uh, you know, uh, employees are being kind of laid off, etc. Nobody is fully protected out of this. I mean, you know, whether you're a government employee, whether you're employed by a nonprofit. Um, kind of university system, like in my case, the London School of Economics, nobody is fully protected from the revenue shock that this has caused. And that is stemming from the supply side restrictions about people not being able to interact in the way because of the um, uh, pandemic uh, infection issue. Now, of course, because of that, if we all suppose had, so just think about the alternative scenario. Suppose everybody in India had a credit card with a reasonable uh, you know, credit limit so that until the public health crisis was played out, right, we could have uh, you know, essentially not any income constraint to pay that off. Of course, it's a completely you know, unrealistic thought experiment, but it's a thought experiment, right? So in that case, the demand side would be taken care of because you could say that, hey, we have this credit card and maybe there's some government back guarantee to it, whatever. And suppose this was implemented well. All these are suppose, and that's what one advantage of having one, those of us who do theory or kind of conceptual analysis, we have the luxury of, of course, the implementation of such a scheme would indeed be very hard. But the point here is that that would take care of the demand side of things mm. to some degree. 
if you leave out expectational effects and things like that, that, okay, you have this, but you don't even know what's going to happen one year, two years, three years down the line, and that might cause you to also underspend. But even if you took out the you know, demand side of it, the supply shock is very much there because of the restrictions on, on movement, et cetera. But at least that would be the primary considerations at that point, that how do you make sure that people get their essentials and some minimal movements, like what has been happening in more um, sort of developed countries, that there are restrictions on people's ability to go to shops or other essential services, right? And uh, certain physical distancing rules are being implemented. But now let's relax this thought experiment. People do not have this credit card, right? With this fictional credit card where we can withhold, withstand a dip in your income or a dip in your employment, right? Um, employment uh, status. So therefore, there is also a massive underspending, right? Which is induced by the fact that people either do not have the income or they're being extremely cautious about, we don't know what's gonna happen a few months from now. Now, based on this, you know, if it was just the, if the demand side was somehow could be taken care of, then it would be a supply problem, which is largely an infrastructure and regulation problem. How do you make sure that the essentials show up while the public health crisis is tackled, which is the front line of this crisis and the economic front is the, you know, second line, next line, but the front line is the public health side. But now, given the fact that, uh, again, I don't need to, to this audience give out all the numbers about India's uh, uh, fraction of the poor and, and all the CMIE or the, you know, temporarily made public and then withdrawn NSS 2017-18 numbers and all of that. But the bottom line is that for a vast segment of the population, the income flow stoppage, right? Uh, and, and which has been Azim Premzi uh, uh, researchers have done a very, uh, very good study. And there are other studies too that shows the dip in income, dip in consumption, et cetera, right? So that has really caused a simultaneous kind of uh, shift of the demand curve to the left, okay? And of course the supply curve itself is uh, kind of moved. It's a supply shock as well. So all in all, I would say, you know, prices have not started rising as alarmingly as at some point it might. Uh, but the reality is that income has stagnated for, again, using a very simple kind of aggregate supply, aggregate demand kind of framework. Given this, going back to your Moin question, um, uh, what could the government have done? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not a supporter of universal basic income because somehow I think that's the optimal solution to a you know, tax welfare scheme. Anybody who has done public economics 101 knows that that's not remotely the optimal yeah. uh, income come uh, redistribution uh, mechanism. Um, and indeed, there are public uh, goods that are needed. There are other ways you would want to make it contingent or conditional on individual economic traits and all of that. So to me, and especially in my recent uh, long paper that I've written with Karthik Morali Dharan, which uh, was um, available as a uh, India Policy Forum a working paper, we kind of say, okay, do it at a level that's affordable, say 1% of the GDP, commit, commit to that, okay? That itself is, is kind of doable, which has to say that it may not amount to much, but the main reason for advocating that is the targeted problem and the selection problems are huge. So they're huge because of the obvious thing that we already have seen in the context of the PM Kisan, the extra amount that was given uh, for the uh, women under the Jandhan, you know, for the Jandhan accounts, you know, after the crisis, women were entitled to some extra payments as well as pensioners, right? And then the PM Kisan has, has, has uh, already was, you know, budgeted, you know, the allocation was there. Again, number of studies are pointing out that the targeting is really not very good. A lot of people are not getting it, right? So once again, I think there is a lot of unnecessary heat in the basic income debate. And the point is, look, the way I look at it, suppose you are distributing, say, flood relief. Let's think of a kind of situation where you're trying to distribute flood relief. Ideally, you should give it to people whose you know, uh, homes have been most affected, people who are poor, etc. But in an immediate kind of crisis response where your goal is to essentially minimize the probability of those who are deserving missing it, as opposed to worrying about those who are undeserving getting it, you should 
essentially have a more universal program. And indeed, uh, several economists who are not exactly supporters of UBI have said that for this period, you know, um, some kind of an income transfer scheme, which, which could even be universal, they would be supportive of. And similarly, across the broad range of opinion, people have said PDS entitlements should be made universal because of, again, a lot of these migrant workers and others who have not uh, been getting the PDS, which otherwise has done a very good job in, in, in and in providing a subsistence support uh, to the population. So I would say that since we do not have that mythical credit card scheme that in an ideal world, we could just somehow think about, say, you know, some kind of a planner who says, hey, I'm going to guarantee this. I'll not tell you how, but I'm going to guarantee this. So all of you get a, this credit card where you can, you know, survive. And of course, with some limited limit, you know, uh, how much you can draw. In the absence of that, therefore, uh, to handle the demand side of things, which will then have implications on the supply side through the standard kind of Keynesian story, uh, I think that would be the appropriate method. There is still time to do it. And I understand the budget constraints and uh, things that uh, people have been writing, uh, writing about, but even there we can do more. So, I, I mean, my only uh, kind of two cents on that would be, I think there are three key things. Uh, it has been very clearly seen in the trajectory of response, at least by uh, the way things have happened in the last um, six or seven years. And I think even before that uh, uh, has been that a lot of decisions are largely taken on the immediate uh, political and, and, and also economic feasibility of, of moves. Uh, that is the way at least most of the times the government works. I mean, so assuming that this was an election year, which was a national election year and a crisis like this would have unfolded, maybe the response of the government in trying to do far more uh, in terms of reaching out to the, the bottom two quintiles of um, the, the population beyond going for the PDS, I think entitlement that has gone in uh, could have been a possibility. The second, and that's the point which I, in fact, personally, I've not understood much about is why have the states been not given uh, far more resources to be able to manage and respond to the crisis? So that only the, whoever we want, we get to get a chance to talk to within the government, let's say the, the, the Delhi government, or even in the, in the case of the UP state government, which in fact has the same party uh, in power as the national party, uh, one of the key concerns that has been expressed, um, at least by those who are candid enough to speak about this, was the fact that uh, uh, the union government has not offered much of a direct uh, transfer or credit line for the states as such. So what they've done is they've opened up windows for open market operation style uh, raising of, of loans and a lot of states are not too keen on doing that. But given the fact that the ultimate uh, state authority of implementation happens to be of, of most states, um, now states are, are increasingly struggling. As a result, what they're trying to do is uh, increase fee-based revenue sources. So um, like I would give you an example, in a city like Lucknow, which, which is where I come from, it is impossible to find any of the traffic signals working. Um, that, is, that is regulated from, by the police. For the first time I've seen in, in my adult life, all, almost five to six traffic signals now being obeyed and being complied with because now there is almost a 1500, 2000 rupee fine that the state is, is imposing and the police is right there in the corner doing it. Because I mean, the, one of the reasons is that the police officer is saying that we have to impose this because the state is running out of other uh, sources of revenue. So this takes me to another point of, uh, of question and because uh, we have uh, plenty of questions also coming in from the audience, so I, I don't want to take more time on this, but one or two key areas that we need to focus is on the labor uh, reform and the labor landscape uh, scenario. And let me just kind of go back to a point that, and this was one of the questions that we shared was, particularly with respect to this uh, discussion around the need for labor reforms for attracting uh, more investment, uh, let's say by states, we started seeing that states like UP, Madh uh, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, they started kind of ad hocly changing their, their labor um, laws. And in fact, we had a long discussion about this with Professor Mehta as well. But the part that I'm looking at, and, and that's a question that we put forward, is a more theoretical question, and one which is uh, relevant in the Indian context as well, that um, somewhere this, this uh, rapid substitution of capital uh, with 
uh, that of a labor intensive mode of production has been something that has been seen as part of a kind of a neoliberal uh, economic framework or design for a long period of time. But having said that, the existing regulations in place were, were largely seen to be far more complex. So just to quote from, from an article also that, that you would written, according to a study by Team Lee's uh, capital, uh, labor capital relations are governed by 463 acts, uh, 32,542 compliances and 3,048 filings. This governance uh, regime does relatively little to protect labor. Uh, moreover, its complexity and associated red tape have contributed to the persistence of informality. It is this reality and not the urgency to attract global capital that needs to drive the debate on labor law reform. Yet in the rush to promote ease of doing business, deregulation of labor has taken precedence over the real debate India should be having, which is how to rebalance regulation to enhance the bargaining power of labor without unnecessarily constraining capital. Now, this has been one of the center points of a lot of questions we have been asking as part of the work we have been doing, how to kind of rebalance the bargaining power, more skewing them towards the workers as against kind of trying to give the incentives that have been given to the private sector, which has not worked to that same extent. So, as an illustration, and just to respond to this, would you say that it's time now that the Mandrega uh, scheme, which was seen with large uh, you know, skepticism with the, with the current regime when it was coming to power, it has still continued to, to tax heavy on it in the sense that to spend more money. We've seen some positive returns out of it already. Um, but is there time now to think of a Mandrega style urban job guarantee uh, scheme, which is, uh, uh, probably a, a scheme that can help doing both increase consumption demand and uh, give more agency to to workers that's a question that we wanted to ask no that's a again i think there's a lot of uh, uh, richness in the set of issues you mentioned here so uh, let me quickly try to set something aside which is a bit of a residual from the earlier question and the very beginning of the current question about um, um, revenue sharing, et cetera, between the center and the state before coming to the main question about labor laws that you, that you asked. So if you ask me what is a real conceptual problem in, in the government's dealing of it, and this is not unique to this current government, this is also true of, of, of governments in developed countries too, um, uh, a, a, even though there has been some realizations, as in the case of Rishi Sunak's budget, etc., or not exactly a budget, the revised plan, um, and 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 this is the following: it is basically a form of supply side um, uh, thinking, which is to say that hey, in the end, if you have uh, all the kind of shops and businesses and factories all up and running, the physical things, right? then somehow people will, it, they will get peopled. So workers will show up, consumers will show up, and that is all that is needed, right? Now, there's a very old tradition of that in economics, right? Now, one could almost say that even though J.B. Say had something else in wine when he said supply, will, supply creates its own demand, I think a variation of this is that, okay, take care of the supply side, help businesses stay uh, afloat through the loan guarantees and other things, the rest will, they will do it. They will keep their workers on payroll and, you know, demand will come, etc. Now, when the economy is, you know, it's think about the analogy that when, say, suitcases are traveling smoothly over a conveyor belt and maybe a very con com complex conveyor belt, the important thing is to make sure that the conveyor belt is running. Then the suitcases will take care of themselves, you know, whatever. But when there has been a massive pile up, in that case, you know, just starting the conveyor belt will lead to more and more chaos and so on. So in other words, and this is something not just um, some of us who would be, you know, maybe considered to be diehard Keynesians or, or worse, um, you know, um, uh, uh, you know uh, it, it's something that Robert Lucas said uh, right after the financial crisis that anytime a market economy goes into intensive care, you know, Keynes comes back. <laughs> 
Why? Because it's the same thing that normally I shouldn't tell you the puncture that you should do this, you should not do that, right? But if I'm your doctor and you just had an accident, I will tell you that you should not move and all of that. And there has to be a process by which you're induced out of, you know, whatever state that, you know, is not your fully fit state. So when economies are fit and running, they may not be running at a huge level of capacity or prosperity, but they are roughly running. Then I can understand that in the end, we need structural improvements, you know, infrastructure investment, you know, greater operation, uh, expansion of markets and all a lot of the supply side measures I fully actually on board with, which would essentially shift the production possibilities frontier up. But when the economy is in the equivalent of a car pile up or maybe a conveyor belt pile up, you do need, you know, people, you know, uh, you know, people uh, are, you know, in the end supply and demand, right? These are uh, two sides of the same coin, right? I mean, your left hand supplies and then your right hand demands, you know, that's how economics works, right? So if each of us are in a little uh, equilibrium economy that we supply and then we demand and then our interdependent supplies and demands all kind of, you know, like in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a network, right? There is an amplification of this. And so for that, you know, you need the handholding in terms of the demand side to get boosted before which the supply and demand uh, kind of chains will again connect with each other and the conveyor belt will uh, uh, start moving along. So that was my kind of general point. And about the fiscal stuff, again, I really, you know, there are a lot of people have written on it, but I, I don't think other than a severe amount of fiscal shortages at the central level and a certain lack of concern for almost, we have, you know, centralization of regulatory powers uh, to the center, but decentralization of responsibilities and, and, and revenue earning. It's the, again, the particular Atanebhar model of India, it seems, where a lot of the things we will restrict what you can do, but then we'll tell you, yeah, you have to depend on yourself. You know, uh, if, if, if in some ways, and they are kind of not, they don't quite gel that you can either, you know, think of, you know, at, 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 at the risk of diluting um, uh, at the seriousness of the thing a little bit, think of a parental model a very strict parent who then doesn't, you know, really pay the school fees and stuff, you know, in some ways it doesn't quite add up, right? Either you're a strict parent, but you're also, you know, uh, giving the resources where it's needed. So I think there is a certain uh, discordance here, right? And while the overall revenue scarcity is very real, and it's not like even if the center bent over backwards, there's a lot of money floating around, but surely more could be done in terms of the GST revenue sharing and so on there could be surely more of a partnership going in terms of the true spirit of federalism, right? So I think that would be my point. Well, that was a little bit of an elaborate um, uh, kind of you know, response to some of the early opening remarks that you had on this question. Look, on the labor laws, and this is a piece that grew out of conversations with uh, Yamini Ayer, uh, with whom you know we, we, we have been having this broad discussion about state capacity, you know, what kind of should be the legal framework for a kind of second generation post-liberalization, you know, and this was, of course, you know, in some ways, uh, some of these discussions go back before the crisis hit. And of course, the crisis has now uh, cropped up, uh, a whole set of issues have cropped up. So I think this is where, let me give you, make a few conceptual points because labor laws and, you know, many of you are, um, are very aware of many of the complexities and, the, and, and the, uh, you know, both the legal framework as well as the implementation issues. I think this is the core issue. We can all agree that certain laws are needed in the labor market. Why? Because you could always make a complete free market argument that, hey, no laws are needed. You can do exactly whatever you want because it's voluntary contracting between, say, laborer and the firm, right? Now, the trouble with that framework is if you had a perfect judicial system, which I don't think we have, uh, in that case, any time a firm behaves in a way that is not as according to the contract, whatever that contract may be, independent of labor laws, right? Uh, 
if everybody knew that we are working in a very strict kind of enforcement framework, then you could argue, right, that, okay, fine, you know, it's a labor uh, surplus economy. So clearly, if you want to stipulate very high minimum wages, lots of benefits from workers, there will be obvious pressures for firms to, and the workers to collude and bypass it, right? I mean, it's the classic thing, suppose, as academics, suppose the government regulates that any private university has to pay a minimum salary of X to hire somebody. As a result, they cut down hiring. Yeah, you can easily see the Ronald Coase type argument that we would have, you know, incentives to have uh, various ways of bypassing this law because uh, workers, or in this case, employees, are keen on having a job, and firms are having a. So the point is, therefore, we have to be realistic about what a labor surplus economy does to the relative bargaining power. But subject to that, we should also have strong safeguards, because I think one of the most alarming aspects of this uh, uh, things that were announced in UP and MP and then kind of uh, the governments walked back. And I would say that's a good thing, given the outrage that ensued, that, you know, there is a sort of, I would say, more traditional left that would be opposed to any labor law reform because it's a bit of a bugbear. It's something that, you know, you say that that's just a bad thing, right? Now, I think any, I would say, if you come out of that framework, clearly this is a very different economy from one when, you know, say in the US, Ford Motors, or in, in the case of the whole, you know, uh, big, big factories and the unions and so on, right? The, the, you know, that, that strength that has declined over the, uh, over the years, right? So therefore, and going back to the early comment about the informal sector. So any law that really doesn't apply to 90% of the workforce, right? I mean, you immediately have a problem, you know, what are we talking about here, right? So therefore, whatever law we have, we have to take those guys in. Now, of course, they're in the informal sector. Part of the reason is because they want to bypass the you know, laws there. That's why they're kind of informal, right? And once again, I think this plethora of laws and the numbers you quoted out, once again, this is the classic case of you're trying to spread a net to catch fish, which are kind of too small and too slippery, and they will immediately escape. So you keep on, you know, maybe expanding the net, making it whatever, you know, changing the shape and so on, but they keep, still keep on slipping. So I think I want to make three core points. One is you do need labor laws as much as you do need any, uh, in any transaction, you need some consumer protection laws, you need some security of property laws. Why? Because otherwise there is always malfeasance. There are always employers who will not pay workers their dues or and, and so on. So therefore, whatever is the wage contract. So suppose we were to take a very free market approach, but even there, even a free market, there has to be some wages, some benefits, some terms and conditions about leaves and things. And therefore this has to be backed by some legal thing. So therefore to say that, oh no, we labor laws are somehow a leftist kind of, you know, a conspiracy to, um, you know, uh, to whatever, you know, uh, dampen the growth prospects of India. That is just, you know, that's just ideology. I don't think there's any, it's a serious point. So therefore we do need labor laws. But number two, I think this is where some of the center right critiques are, uh, have, have a point here is look, we can all work write down the ideal system of what people should be getting and what kind of an ideal society we want. But from that wish to stipulate, you know, stipulating the laws and then enforcement, you know, that's a huge gap between, you know, there's, as they say, the, you know, road may be uh, paved with good intentions, but that the road may not lead up to a very good place, right? So therefore, again, anybody who doesn't really paying attention to that, you're not being empirical in terms of the actual welfare of workers, even if that was suppose your only goal, that look, I don't care about this growth, so you know, I'm just only going to focus on worker welfare. We have to therefore have streamlined laws and laws that are more uh, 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 kind of reflective of the changing labor capital relationship that has automation and IT has created as well as the informalization of the labor force, et cetera. We need to have, have that kind of a mindset that we shouldn't just support whatever forms of labor laws were there. And number three and final point, I, and I could go on, but I also want to have a chance to have Q&A. Any form of labor laws that are 
designed that creating greater flexibility, which is what the pro-growth or pro-reform folks are coming from, suppose we are on board with that, because at the end of the day, those guys are right in the sense that a thriving labor market with more labor demand and more people getting jobs, that's what we all want, right? And of course, workers should also be paid well. So it's not like more people getting jobs, but they're getting a good wages. That's the kind of vision we want. That's the only reason we care about growth. Otherwise, it's just a number. Otherwise, it's just some return that some very rich you know, business houses are earning. You know, why do we care about economic growth, right? Economic growth basically means that the level of living of ordinary people are going up. So which is to say wage incomes are going up, to put it very bluntly. And that can only go up if either W goes up or L goes up or both goes up, right? The more reformist guys are saying, okay, you know, you need to have a kind of deregulatory framework so that L goes up, employment opportunities go up, and then somehow things will trickle down. The labor demand will push up the wages, etc. That's where my original point applied that you know even there you need certain laws to safeguard worker safety and certain basic conditions because left to the own devices in the free market you could have slavery you know free markets are perfectly consistent with even having slavery so therefore there's nothing great about free markets unless you have protection of you know individual rights right think about it otherwise we could you know and it has happened also under the name of trade and so on right so therefore there has to be some legal framework number two that legal framework should be more nuanced, more uh, flexible than very rigid things because they will be bypassed and then the enforcement would create corruption and distortive effects that might even outweigh the uh, purported gains, right? My third point though, so I summarized the first two points. The third point is any reform of labor laws, which is a way of creating more flexibility in the labor market to stimulate greater hiring has to go hand in hand with an expansion of the safety net because otherwise again you're coming to this basic problem that you're not using both the carrot and the stick to the extent that you have flexible labor markets that would say that look some of the public sector type you know lifetime guarantees of jobs without you know necessarily the productivity or the you know incentives to work that may not be such a great idea. But if you seriously believe in that idea, to be able to sell that in a democratic society, right? You should also have a system that, hey, you could lose your job, but then you have these various you know, protection measures so that it's not just you and your job, that's the only thing standing between you and starvation, right? So once again, so therefore, I think the reformists um, uh, should be more consistent if they have want both their proposals to be more humane and mindful of what in the end is economic growth you know, all about, as well as pragmatic, not to have every time you utter the word, we are gonna reform the labor laws, very natural reaction and it's an understandable reaction that everybody gets nervous that you are in an already very unequal bargaining regime, you are not doing that. Because doing that, A, creates that protection and B, like has happened with Narega, and I'll stop with this, it also has indirect effects as the work of uh, Clement Inboyat and Pat has shown that one of the big ways Narega has played out is by increasing the outside option which goes back to uh, an idea that I have with Abhijit Banerjee and Paul Gertler in a paper we wrote in, uh, a while ago on tenancy reform. The tenancy laws essentially empower tenants. So the exact law may not be implemented, but because they have the outside option or the threat point of using that law, that improves things. So to the extent you have a safety net, to the extent you have, you know, well, implemented labor laws that also empowers workers uh, to essentially, you know, uh, secure a higher wage than they would be able to do that. And that in the case of Narega, the implementation of Narega, that uh, indirect effects have been strong and that's a demonstration of that. And yes, I would be supportive of an urban equivalent of that. You know, there are of course huge implementation issues, you know, whether that will cause again, a uh, migration flow that may be, you know, especially given the current environment where we still have to forget, I was going to say the elephant in the room, but maybe uh, the virus in the room would be the more appropriate, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, phrase to use that we have to keep that in mind. But yes, I would be supportive of that. 
Uh, Dipang Shu, I, I, I don't think you, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, sorry, sir. So, no, thank you, sir. That was a very comprehensive response. And we have around 20 uh, quick uh, minutes to be able to take a few questions from the audience. And they've already typed a few in. But just before we kind of get into that, because you mentioned about tenancy reforms. And I mean, one of the huge set of reforms that were kind of, I think, celebrated kind of a little bit over uh, the board was the recent agri-market um, discussions around uh, the, the, the changes being brought about to the minimum support price structure, which is long overdue, APMCs, which it depends largely on the state, land um, acquisition, um, and predominantly on, on issues around promoting contract farming. Now, I mean, Dr. Pranav Sain has mentioned this and, and a few others from what I recollect that you know, even with things like contract farming, there are two parties to the contract. One is probably the farmer may be interested in being able to, 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 to move in a certain order and have a more progressive contract structure. But do we have right now at this point of time due to the kind of structure of the domestic private investment scenario as the way it looks like, we have other party to that contract which is as willing and, and I mean, his argument it seems was, and which, which makes total sense, um, is that um, maybe we are not able to uh, uh, have uh, 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 an ecosystem which may allow these uh, much needed or much awaited uh, reforms to be able to be institutionalized. It's like basically uh, bank mergers may sound like a good idea when banks and the financial system is working uh, reasonably well, but if you have banks kind of battling and recovering or recuperating from the demonetization shock and then have a huge chunk of NPAs um, to be able to deal with. And then you have a bank merger announced. So the timing of, of the whole uh, system may be uh, not so fair. I know you've mentioned this earlier that you may not be, and probably Roshan, it might be having Roshan Kishore at some point of time as part of someone who's done some work on the agricultural market system. So he might give us a more, but how do you see that this discussion on land uh, farming, scaling up and having a more, uh, you know, kind of a, a more price autonomy on being able to distribute your products um, or produce at a ma larger scale, which has been a big concern for farmers. We see that in Haryana, we see that in a number of other states as well, uh, is something that you think uh, can be dealt with. And there are a few questions. I'll just echo those out right after. Thank you. Okay, I'll try to be brief uh, again in uh, keeping in mind the time constraints and, and uh, uh, having some uh, uh, Q&A. So let me just make a couple of broad points and this is by uh, no stretch a comprehensive answer uh, to the set of issues and especially if you're going to have uh, uh, Roshan and others uh, who have really studied this um, in carefully I think that that would be really good discussion to have and 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 um, so uh, so I would say that I just have a couple of broad conceptual points to make one is hey there's always supply and demand the main problem with agriculture is not necessarily output although output is of course a problem but it's the returns that farmers get which is prices right and indeed in a situation of course there's MSP and then you have the FCI go downs, you know, full and all the kind of discussions that we know. But the bottom line is that farm income has to very much do with the prices of the crops, right? As well as, um, you know, the prices of inputs, you know, fertilizers and things like that. And that's where you have a perennial problem. Now, what is the issue here? So once again, it goes back to, and, and, and it, uh, it might be like a broken record, but you know, broken records uh, do sometimes, you know, are, 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 I say the same thing again and again, which is with the massive demand problem, you know, you need to essentially, the main problem is to connect farmers with either domestic or international kind of, you know, the demand side so that that pulls up the prices, et cetera. Otherwise, you only have the government instruments of MSP to use, and that then becomes a political kind of, you know, tension between the push and pull. And especially, you know, then you also have the consumers to be protected. So suppose you do all of this, but even the laws are saying, okay, if prices are going up too high, then we are going to have to step in and kind of not uh, have the more liberal framework that is being pointed out. 
Now, I think indeed it is Roshan in one of his pieces has pointed out that yeah. in the last decade or so, there's been many in instances of this happening, happening the 100% or more price increase, yeah. Yeah. but then the law will not be effective. But anyway, so that my first point is therefore, we cannot bypass the demand and supply side issue. The second point is a supply side point, and this, among others, have been made by uh, my uh, uh, friends um, uh, Yamini Ayer and Mekhala Krishnamurti, especially Mekhala Krishnamurti has written a fair bit on this, yeah. is basically you need infrastructure, in particular the village markets and the mandis. You essentially, you know, she uh, mentions things like the Bihari farmers, who kind of, you know, they basically say that not having enough local markets and without having invested in the infrastructure of those markets, you are then dependent on either the government procurement system or a couple of big kind of, you know, um, sort of, you know, wholesale uh, traders who will buy for the farmers where the bargaining powers are completely stacked uh, against the farmers. So, I would say the first point is, yes, we need some notion of demand side management. Otherwise, this is a problem that will just not go away. Number two is, yes, we need to reform the supply side and some of the you know, market integration, etc. sounds like a good idea. But once again, the government needs to do both the easy and dictative aspect of the policy, but it also should follow up with the more difficult and committing resource side of policy, because policies in the end, both stipulative that you shall do this, or you no longer have to do this, right? But it has to also backed up with, okay, here's infrastructure, because as government, you know, this is whether it's the state governments or the central government, and doing one without the other, it's like, you know, it's not going to produce the desired results. So I, I would say this would be kind of my yeah, yeah. second broad comment on this. But this is indeed, a, you know, agriculture, uh, as we know, that it it's generates less than 20% of our GDP, but it employs uh, um, half the uh, workforce. And the welfare implications are huge and farmers crisis and all of this has been um, kind of a constant feature. Uh, I will not uh, say yeah. anything uh, yeah. unless some specific point comes up. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. And uh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for your response. I mean, one of the points that me and Roshan, I mean, we debate, probably discussed this earlier, but I wanted to put it in it was the idea of uh, something that uh, a few of us did proposed was um, on having commodity-based cooperatives as a model um, to be able to develop uh, more local um, organizations and we have a very successful cooperative based models in areas sugar. like sugar, sugar cooperatives in Maharashtra. Yeah. yeah, but but to diversify that and allow for that, in fact, FPOs, farmer producing organizations working down in the south have have given some very good results. But just to move on, and I think the questions that we have, um, let me just uh, echo a few because some, I mean some of these have been already discussed, so I'm I'm not going to go back uh, to to the same questions, but. Uh, one question which uh, um, is a question that is asked by Snehal is, is this big uh, question on China and uh, <laughs> the, the discussion around the fact that given the fact, I mean, this whole discussion around India becoming far more self-reliant self or, you know, kind of decoupling, it's, it's, in, it's already quite complex interwoven supply chains with the, um, the Chinese. Um, I and mean, you've talked about a, a better incentive structure for firms. So let me kind of ask, um, based on your work on how incentives work and at what points you don't, um, if there was a hypothetical on MSMEs which have, let's in West Bengal, because I've seen a lot of uh, flights between Kolkata and Kunming. And I, I in fact, connected with a lot of uh, traders in the flight. I was very surprised to see. 80% of the flight having garment manufacturers and textile traders taking all the supplies. And the question I was trying to ask them was, was what is the incentive that they had to, to take this? They said that flying is cheap, it's not that expensive, and they're really getting an advantage of scale in selling these products out. Now, the interesting thing was that from Kunming in Yunnan, this produce was going into different parts of China and was getting the made in China tag and coming back to India. So uh, the, the question here I would probably want to ask is, um, which Snehal puts in, is how can India perhaps uh, 
you know, innovate a little bit more on having a better incentive structure to decouple its, uh, you know, kind of direct import dependence from, from the Chinese, uh, if you have any response. Uh, would you prefer that I take, put in a couple of questions? So maybe you give or, a couple of, I mean, this yes, is a yes, very good first, question, but maybe yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah, so uh, let me just, me just take a few because there, um, so there's a question by Kevil Singh, uh, who's a scholar from IIT Kampur, um, asking uh, how, given the fact how badly the MSMEs and the informal sector has been affected, um, how long do you think it might take for them to actually recover? I mean, that's, that's a question which, is generally, I mean, it's almost a you know, astrological uh, question on how to be able to look at it. But but how can MSMEs? Because MSMEs, for example, Dr. Rajan has also pointed out recently had this direct credit window released by the RBI, but they were finding that they were piling up more of bad debts and loans, and that was a big uh, a concern. How, um, so what can, for example, banks do? I think that would be a, the the question extrapolated from from Kevil's point. So these two, and there are a few others, and I'll, I'll relay those across. Thank you. Okay. So um, I would say on the first question, um, it's interesting. I, I did mention it in our informal um, uh, chat earlier before this uh, event started. Uh, I just finished a piece, um, a long essay actually, uh, with uh, Ashok Kotwal and uh, Bharat Ramaswamy. Um, it, uh, should be, um, out, uh, you know, published, uh, you know, so fairly soon, maybe in a week, week or so, where we kind of make the argument that uh, there is the demand-centered view of economic policy, walking away from the more supply-side view of things, right, where you, you know, have all the uh, supply, um, you know, incentives, you know. Uh, regulatory uh, relaxations in place, but in the end, you need business uh, for you know the engine to start, for the suppliers to be supplying, and that would generate demand, etc. And we highlight three points here: that first, having the advantage of a kind of income support targeted to rural areas where most of our poor live, is the Keynesian bang for the extra expenditure demand bang would be high. Straightforward point, everybody knows it. The second point is that once you have that, the poor are more likely to spend on goods that have higher labor elasticity in terms of, you know, and some of this will go come back to the urban areas. We actually look at some of the CMI pyramid data in terms of the you know percentage uh, spent on various types of goods so therefore there will be a feedback effect on you know uh, going back to the urban areas you know the biscuits were a good example that during this crisis among other things you know one good which is you know not a rural product but its demand spike was that but there are several others we can think of that right and i think the third point to point out is because of this effect there will be successive rounds of then you know once it generates demand for this urban goods it will then uh, generate further demand for both rural and urban goods so we can think of like two matrices one where you know if you have extra income coming in the demand is getting distributed based on rural urban you know uh, rich poor etc and then the supply elasticity is that what are these goods, you know, some kind of an input output matrix thing and what are the, you know, uh, sectors in which the demand will show up and that will have further impacts in how those incomes will be spent. What is the way of saying all this and what does it have to do with Kunming and, and China? Well, one of the things we were debating, you know, so this therefore is harmonious. So rural and urban growth, formal and informal sector growth can be harmonious, right? So if you might think that you're directly helping say the rural poor and to a lot of people who are not used to, you know, uh, general equilibrium thinking, which Keynesian economics is a early practical example of general equilibrium thinking, that you do something somewhere and that has an indirect effect that could be quite important, right? Uh, as opposed to you're just wasting money. You know, for a lot of people who are opposed to these transfers, you're A, wasting money, B, creating incentives for people not to work, which given how poor people are is not really an option, but leaving that aside. 
So therefore, you do have this argument that this kind of uh, you know strategy will work out between say rural and urban. But now let's change this and think of China to be rural and say the US to be urban. Because in the international trade domain or the developed world versus say China, right? Why, why couldn't the same thing work out? What is it that China is doing this with India, the garment seller versus the, you know, uh, kind of deindustrializing certain parts of the US that is really leading to kind of political reaction that we are seeing. And the main argument, I think, has to do with the following that, see, there is a product chain argument that as your economy becomes, what I had told initially is, okay, you increase demand here, that will spill over to demand for something that then will generate income, et cetera, et cetera. But if you think of countries or regions, they also go up the product ladder. So as a say semi-village area becomes semi-urban, then becomes more urban, you're focusing more on the service sector, you're focusing more on the high value added, you know, MSMEs producing those kind of things, you know, going uh, down from basic agriculture and that too has various stages. So what can be a harmonious and complementary demand cycle between say urban and rural areas why does it work out between say india and china why didn't it work out between china and the us yeah. i think that is a really interesting okay. question and that's where i'm coming back to the kunming point and the main reason is that china essentially um, has not because of its you know import restrictions most of its expenditure has been more on the luxury end of consumption in developed countries whether it's real estate higher education tourism and all of that but otherwise if this was the case that as china develops and it goes to higher and higher value chain activities it would then economic logic would say the demand it generates then should spill over to less rich countries like india and indonesia and bangladesh you know, not necessarily the US. And that's how a harmonious complementary cycle could work out at a, at a global scale. Mm -hmm. But that's where I think this is the argument that, you know, if you use trade policy very selectively in promoting exports and these kind of subcontracting of activities, that is kind of you're keeping the gains of trade to yourself and you're not kind of letting the whole, you know, ripple effects of positive gains from trade uh, benefit other parts of the world. Mm. So, and that, you know, one can't only really blame China for this. I mean, you know, we, we do have, a, you know, lots of um, uh, restrictions in terms of, you know, uh, exports and imports. I think that's the logic to think about because otherwise, if you think about rural and urban areas, right, any form of beneficial demand cycle can only seem complementary in terms of boosting growth in both rural and urban areas unless it's all focused on the richer segments in which case it will be a very kind of you know it's like going to be the iceberg type growth model where only the top of the things will happen the rest of it will kind of stay submerged so coming back to your question would we have an ideal world where all the countries decide that, hey, we are going to have a harmonious growth process, where as we grow richer, we are going to then pass the demand to less, uh, uh, you know, uh, lower income economies to specialize in those goods and eventually everybody uh, will be lifted out of poverty. That's not realistic. So we too have to use trade policy somewhat strategically and therefore we cannot you know, uh, uh, unilaterally lift these kind of restrictions. But anyway, so coming back to that would be sort of, you know, what the China model has been and whether it will be easy for India to follow. That would be the answer to that question. Yeah. So and there was a yeah, second MSME, question. Yeah, MSME uh, question. Yeah, because we just, uh, we've stretched slightly a little bit ahead of time. So um, I'm just going to tell the audience that we're going to just stretch for five more minutes I take the next two questions. So, sir, maybe on uh, just topping up with the question on the MSME, uh, let me just bring uh, because I don't want to be the one who has not been able to relay the questions across. Actually, a lot of the questions that were coming in, whether it was by Prathamesh, Tejasmini, uh, to uh, Rohan, I mean, so a lot of those have been already addressed in the previous uh, responses. So, I don't want to kind of uh, sound more repetitive. There is one question which uh, was there on uh, the national education policy. And I know it's, it's, it's a bit of a completely different uh, off ballpark stretch uh, to be able to make, but I think just on the kind of 
a question around policy and the intent of policy, the implementation of policy, um, and, and the concerns around that. Um, is there something that, 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 that you could probably respond towards? And this is a question that came in, um, if I can, I would like to probably have the name of the person. Yeah, Siddharth, um, that uh, how, I mean, it may, while it may sound all revolutionary and, and path breaking in its holistic vision, um, uh, to what extent probably is it um, economically feasible or strategically feasible to decentralize and implement it? Maybe that's a question that, that seems to be coming in. Just in case, if you want to take a dig at that, uh, if you feel that you're not comfortable, then probably we can have No, a I think, I, yeah, I would say that, again, this is a very kind of important and somewhat, you know, nebulous set of issues that the new education policy, you know, touches upon. And there's a whole range of discussions going on. Let me not say anything very briefly, uh, other than, uh, you know, um, the general critiques of the kind of policy making that we have seen in yeah, terms yeah, of, yeah, uh, right, exactly. I mean, um, uh, where is the uh, commitment of resources, you know, what is the broad vision here, how much of it is imposing a certain ideological agenda, whether that's a socio-cultural agenda or some kind of an economic agenda, whatever the underlying, you know, um, ideological or values that are driving it. But let me not, uh, given the short amount of time, say something uh, relatively uh, glib and yeah. not be able yeah. to go Makes to uh, uh, depths Makes of sense. this important question. I'll, I'll probably suggest Siddhar to, to be able to look at the recent paper by Aditya Dasgupta and Devish Kapoor, which discusses the concept of the bureaucratic overload. That's a point I, I discussed in a recent uh, piece on where the bureaucracy finds it difficult to implement ambitious policies. So maybe just to get a response to that, and then maybe we have another chance to, to take a look at this. The final question, sir, and this is a one which is looking at probably triggering a more political uh, response, but um, Dipanshu Singhal asks, uh, not Dipanshu Mohan, but Dipanshu Singhal asks, I have a question for Professor uh, Ghatak. Uh, Professor, do you think that political and economic freedoms um, are related um, as that they are in the Indian context and to what extent do you feel that certain unfreedoms uh, politically are going to impact at the economic freedoms? <laughs> no, okay. So I think this this question, you know, it's 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 like a, you know, um, I think, um, you know, a cricket analogy would be Sebag going out to bat, and you have a ball that is coming that you know it's just you know you, you would have a itch to go go at it, right? And and of course you could get out or you could hit a sixer, uh, and the reason is of course I think uh, one of the so let me first give a kind of somewhat academic answer to this question. I think this question to me is one of the most fundamental questions about when we think of economic and political systems. Why? Because as somebody who, of course, growing up in Bengal, in Presidency College, even in Delhi school, you know, with a loft of left-wing thinking, you know, when you first, I discovered Hayek, as well as Ronald Coase and some of those, you know, um, you know, more Chicago school thinkers, including Milton Friedman, Capitalism and Freedom, etc. I think a really challenging question, and I think Milton Friedman puts it most strongly, that can you have political freedom without economic freedom? And can you have economic freedom without political freedom? Yeah. And I think that as liberals, and liberals in the sense of the term that, like Amartya Sen puts it, development is freedom, I think it's a reasonably inclusive notion for us to accept whatever is our ideological leaning, that we want societies where people have the ability to do the things they want, whichever is the domain, of course, not subject to interfering with the liberties or freedoms of others. And that seems to be a good generic definition, that if tomorrow I want to quit being an economist and want to try to become a, a writer or a film director, maybe following uh, some of the cultural traditions in which I was raised, um, uh, 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 you know, I should have the freedom to do that. Whether I'll succeed or not is a different matter. But going back to this core question, could we have economic freedom without political freedom? The answer is no. 
typically you can, and you know, China is a good example of that, right? I mean, clearly I think that you can have certain kinds of economic freedom. Sure, you can have in a regimented society with certain rules and infrastructure, you know, why the China model has attractions. Ironically, as I joked in one of my NDTV columns, that in the 70s, only the Nakshals used to admire the China model. Yeah, yeah. And in after 2000, it seems the right wing, economically right wing guys admired the China model because it's a tough model that, you know, um, kind of puts a discipline into the whole economic system. Now, the trouble is, I think if you think about the growth process and if you look at writings of Albert Hirschman, of Unbalanced Growth, of Joseph Schumpeter, you know, any form of, and if you take a more kind of biological evolutionary model of economic growth, it really comes from spontaneous interaction within certain networks that then spread to other networks. That's how ideas and, and you know, products, new products come up. And that's where I think we need a basic political freedom to have uh, this, this kind of, you know, economic dynamism, right? Because otherwise, if you're continuously worried that suppose I discover something which maybe have defense potential, you know, and then immediately I, I, I would be under a lot of uh, state pressure uh, uh, to, you know, and that clearly would undermine my incentives. And I can go into the cultural domain that I have a great novel to write, but if I write it, I might immediately get into trouble for saying politically maybe controversial things. So therefore I do think that, but where I do think that the Milton Friedman point also holds on the other side, which I yeah. think more a point that, so on this side, I very much think that it is difficult to have true economic freedom without political freedom. At most you can have a regimented society that can pump up production of routine goods and the growth numbers may look well, but you're not going to be a hub of innovation, hub that will attract talent. And for that, you need more political and cultural freedom. Oh. But the other side of it is also true that if you do not have any economic freedom, but suppose seemingly you have a democratic system where people can vote, you have some rule of law, all of that, right? Even there, we know that, hey, if I know that I work in an organization where how, what my terms are with my boss, will very much affect my career because, you know, it's not an economically free system. Surely it will be very easy for political forces to capture this economic model where how I vote, how I express my opinions may all be subservient to my economic interests. So I would say in general, one should not have, you know, any laws about social or economic uh, systems other than certain indicative tendencies like with supply demand often the framework doesn't work it's still a very useful framework to have in our mind or similarly here i would say freedoms are complementary more economic freedom and more political freedoms are generally going to be complementary but that doesn't mean the relationship is monotonic you know uh, there could be some countries where there could be you know uh, it's it's sort of going in the other direction and I would say in the context of India, as well as across the world, where there is a certain rise in identity politics and, 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 uh, and right-wing populism, and these are things that are, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, people have commented on and so on. I would say forget everything else for the intrinsic kind of reasons why we want every individual to prosper and enjoy certain basic freedoms in a certain environment. I think even for our economic prosperity, right, you cannot have a situation where you do not have certain confidence, not just in the law and order as to if you get into the wrong side of a political uh, debate or, uh, or, 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 or argument, that you will not have the full protection. I think that in the end can never be good. So once again, you know, like all of us can have political views, which may vary from, you know, left to right, you can have various kinds of views. But suppose in the spirit of Rawls, suppose we don't know which end of the political spectrum we'll end up with. What is a set of rules we can all agree on that, hey, I may not like your opinion, but you say it, I may choose not to engage with it, but you should have the freedom to express your opinion, right? So I would say, that is, I don't know whether I was uh, being more uh, Dravid or, or Sebag in, 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 in dealing with this question, uh, 
Mm. But that would be my kind of general take on it. You were, you were more Lakshman. <laughs> okay. All right. like he's my favorite, by the way. I'll let me take this opportunity that he is my favorite of the Fab Four. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. And I, I know we have been awfully uh, delayed with the, with, the, with, the, with the session, but it was just such a fascinating exchange and, and a set of ideas shared. And there's a lot for us to be able to think and dwell on. Uh, of course, this is with your consent. We've, we've, I hope uh, it's fine that we've recorded the session. So it should be available with students for them to be able to go back on uh, at some point of time and would be shared with That's you as fine. well. But, but thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dipangshu. I, I, once again, I really appreciate how thoroughly you prepared the questions and hopefully, uh, you know, uh, this was uh, uh, productive in terms of covering a range of issues. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll be meeting now next on the 22nd of August with Professor Ashwini Deshpande. She'll be talking about the gendered uh, impact of economic shocks and looking at what's happened to the LGBTQ and, and the women uh, labor force participation rate. Um, but thank you and see you soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All the best.